Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and today I would like to discuss what is autonomy and what to do when patients' choices conflict with physician advice. So, what is autonomy? In Western ethics and political philosophy, autonomy refers to the state or condition of self-governance or leading one's life according to reasons, values, or desires that are authentically one's own. Although autonomy is an ancient notion, the term is derived from the ancient Greek words autos, meaning self, and nomos, meaning rule or self-rule, the most influential conceptions of autonomy are modern, having arisen in the 18th and 19th centuries in the philosophies of, respectively, Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill. For Kant, a person is autonomous only if his choices and actions are unaffected by factors that are external or inessential to himself. Thus, a person lacks autonomy to the extent that his choices or actions are influenced by factors such as convention, peer pressure, legal or religious authority, the perceived will of God, or even his own desires. Now, according to the Millian view of autonomy, a person is autonomous to the extent that he directs his actions in accordance with his own values, desires, and inclinations. Mill's view thus contrasts with Kant's in that it does not hold that autonomous persons cannot be motivated by desires. All that it requires is that the uh, desires be their own. The Millian account of autonomy has been more widely accepted within applied ethics than the Kantian account, in part because it appears to be more realistic. This discussion regarding autonomy leads us to mention the doctrine of informed consent. Since the Nuremberg trials, consent has been at the forefront of biomedical ethics. It did not receive detailed examination until the early 1970s when the focus shifted from the physician's obligation to disclose information to the quality of a patient's comprehension or understanding of the information. The forces behind this shift of emphasis were autonomy-driven. The primary justification advanced for requirements of informed consent has been to protect autonomous choice. As such, consent requirements serve primarily as a way to minimize the potential for harm. So, what constitutes the requirements for informed consent? Let's review the requirements for a valid consent. First, there needs to be adequate disclosure of information by the healthcare team. Then, one needs to ensure that a patient has decision-making capacity. So what are the elements of decision-making capacity? Well, first and foremost, the patient needs to understand the factual information that was disclosed. The patient also needs to appreciate the situation he or her is in, needs to have adequate reasoning abilities in order to express a choice. In addition to decision-making capacity, one has to ensure that the choice is voluntary. In other words, the choice is being made in a non-coercive setting. Hence, the goal of informed consent requirements is to enable autonomous persons to make substantially autonomous choices about whether to authorize a medical intervention. Is this always the wisest course of action? The 
most ethical, the most humane. Should autonomy have its limits? So should there be limits to autonomy? Not infrequently, a tension occurs between respecting autonomous choices and discharging our obligations of beneficence or acting in the best interests of patients. So what is the source of the tension between autonomy and beneficence? This tension occurs when we doubt as to whether a patient is actually making an autonomous choice. While there has been a shift from the primacy of beneficence to autonomy in the doctor-patient relationship, the question becomes when should a physician question the presumed autonomous choices of patients, especially when great harms might occur to patient welfare. At this point, I would like to introduce the concept of substantially autonomous choice, taken from the ideas of Faden and Beecham. The concept is that no one makes autonomous choices that are fully autonomous, that is, making choices with complete understanding and that are completely non-controlled. To chain human choices to a goal of fully autonomous decision-making strips the concept of autonomy of any meaningful place in the practical world, where people's actions are rarely, if ever, fully autonomous. The conditions of understanding and non-control may be placed on a broad continuum from fully autonomous, as shown here, to fully non-autonomous. Actions will rarely, if ever, be fully autonomous, but it is possible for action to be substantially autonomous. Hence, rather than requiring persons to act with full understanding and being completely non-controlled, what we strive for in the clinical encounter is for patients' actions to be substantially autonomous. This concept of substantial autonomy functions as a threshold above which acts are treated as being autonomous, and below which they are not autonomous. The decision as, as to how and where to draw this line is based on moral and policy considerations, as we shall see towards the end of this presentation. These concepts are related to the concept of medical paternalism. To be sure, the traditional ethos of medicine was defined by a conception of beneficence that was almost entirely equated with medical paternalism, which is defined by the intentional overriding of a patient's known preferences or actions by a physician, where the physician justifies the action by the goal of benefiting or avoiding harm to the patient. But there are two senses of paternalism. One is labeled strong paternalism, which involves overriding the autonomous choices of the patient. For example, an elderly man who is at peace with the end of his life and does not desire life-prolonging ventilatory support, despite this autonomous choice, he is intubated by the physicians. On the other hand, there is weak paternalism, where one overrides the choices of the patient. But in this case, the choice is non-autonomous, or rather, the patient lacks the capacity to decide. In this case, one is acting in the best interest of a patient who lacks capacity to decide. The question is, how do we know when a patient lacks capacity. While we will discuss how one assesses for decision-making capacity in another lecture, at this point, I would like to discuss the concept of standards of competency. Should the standard for determining competence be the same in all cases, or should it vary with each decision and clinical context? Several commentators have introduced the concept of a sliding scale standard for competency. With few exceptions, most people reject the notion of one standard, endorsing instead a sliding scale that demands a more stringent standard when patients' choices seem to threaten their well-being. As the risk of harm increases for a particular decision, that is, the more that is at stake, the more certain we want to be of the patient's decision-making capacity. Here is an example of the sliding scale standard. For the case of a treatment that has an excellent chance of restoring health and without which 
a patient is likely to die, when the patient agrees to the recommended treatment, their competence is rarely called into question. For example, when a patient with mild dementia agrees to life-saving but relatively risk-free surgery for acute appendicitis, it is unlikely that physicians would call in a psychiatrist to examine the reasoning behind this decision. On the other hand, if the same patient refused the surgery, the test for competency would likely become more stringent as the threat to well-being increases. So, for the case of when a patient wants to refuse intubation, it is not always the case we want to go against that choice. It is rather that we want to be more certain of the patient's capacity. Which statement reflects a more honest formulation? The first statement, the person had reasonable capacity to choose, but I really thought it was not in his best interest to forego the respirator, and so I elected to intubate against his wishes, or the patient really lacked the capacity to make an appropriate decision, so we had no choice but to intubate. The first statement reflects strong paternalism, which should not occur in medicine today, while the second statement reflects weak paternalism, an action that should be encouraged in medicine today. So how should we resolve the tension between autonomy and beneficence? The difficulty comes in deciding when patients are not making substantially autonomous choices. That is the work we need to do. Thank you very much.